to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Listeners, welcome back to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and as always, I'm here with Bill Schofield and with John Harrigan. Hey guys, how's it going? How's it going? How are you? It's good. Doing good. Doing good. Great to be with you guys today. Listeners, thanks again for joining us this week. We want to continue our look at the book of Isaiah. In our last episode, we spent some time talking about resurrection and the restoration of creation, specifically the broader theme of redemption and how that scene in Isaiah and how it's pushed forward through Second Temple literature and into the New Testament, really as a projection of and as maintenance of the covenant that God made with Israel. And we talked a ton about the geographical nature of redemption. One of the phrases you used last week, Bill, was that redemption has a postal code. And it's really impossible to see and understand the biblical idea of resurrection and the restoration of creation outside of or apart from the redemption of Israel and God's plan to maintain his covenant with Israel. Uh, And so why is that? Because the Lord's chosen to use that people specifically as the vehicle of redemption for the rest of the world. So we spent a lot of time developing that through Isaiah and into Second Temple literature in the New Testament last week. And this week, we want to continue our look at the book of Isaiah, and we want to talk about messianism. Messianism may sound like a bizarre word to you, but uh, Messiah or Messianism really just comes from passages we've talked about in the past, like 1 Samuel 2, the idea that God is going to raise up a king and exalt the horn of his anointed. It's just the Hebrew word Mashiach, or, or where we get Messiah from. So this brings in ideas of passages like 1 Samuel 2, 2 Samuel 7. And so let's talk a little bit about this before we get into Isaiah. Uh, what is Messianism? How should we understand it? And uh, and how would scholarship talk about it? Yeah, I mean, the idea of Messianism is, like you said, Josh, it's um, uh, just someone who is anointed to carry out a task uh, on behalf of God. And so you have uh, lots of messiahs, little m messiahs in the Tanakh. Prophets are anointed, priests are anointed, kings are anointed. Uh, but as this idea of particularly the anointed king uh, gets pressed forward in the apocalyptic narrative, then it becomes kind of a universalized reality that uh, there is uh, one person that is going to act on behalf of God Uh, that's going to execute the major elements of the apocalyptic narrative, the day of God, the judgment, the resurrection of the dead, ushering in new heavens and new earth, which God could do on his own without any intermediary uh, in between. But uh, the the messianic idea uh, begins to uh, uh, fill that void that there's somebody that does those things on behalf of God. Yeah, and the the benefit of trying to look, I mean, obviously we lose a lot of detail just kind of doing Isaiah in two or three sessions, but the benefit of looking at it as a whole is you realize how crucial the narrative is to the various themes. Like the themes cannot be separated from the narrative. Right, right. And the redemptive narrative of Jerusalem, for example, you can't separate the Messiah from that story. And so one of the things that we'll find today is that even if we've kind of come to think of of Messianism or Jesus being the Messiah or the Christ, as it's transliterated in the New Testament, uh, we kind of see him in terms that are kind of like a cosmic hero, where he just kind of breaks into the world and saves everybody. And there's it's not... It, it, it's not quite that way in Isaiah, despite all the things that John just said, and he's the one who executes the day of the Lord and the day of vengeance and and restores and, and all these things. It's actually in a larger narrative. And so Isaiah's narrative is really going to basically make it completely illogical that there could be a son of David that could actually do these things that the Messiah is called to do without being a participant in Israel's story. So he's right in the middle of Israel's story. He's not some figure who comes from outside of Israel's story to actually just just to be the hero figure. 
Yeah, and you get this idea also in scholarship that messianism is kind of some sort of late development and uh, that it's, you know, born out of the exile, late exile and and uh, Second Temple Judaism kind of uh, pushes that marginalization. And and but the reality is, is that messianism is tied integrally to the development of the apocalyptic narrative, largely due to the book of Isaiah, I think. Right. Yeah. Because messianism is so central in the book and so many themes from Isaiah get utilized to develop the apocalyptic uh, narrative in the second temple period and messianism's right at the center of all of those in Isaiah so uh, i would say they all develop in tandem because they're it's part of a unified narrative around the covenant and the messiah is not unique uh you know, is not separated or some sort of unique figure like Bill's saying, but is intricately tied to the covenant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's so huge, guys. Well, as we begin to talk about some of these themes of messianism in Isaiah related to the covenant, related to Israel's story, related to themes like the day of the Lord and the judgment and the kingdom of God, let's talk about a few passages. And and again, these passages, I think, as we highlight these few passages, they may be familiar to us already, but seeing them as passages that highlight who the Messiah is as the one who's going to execute the day of the Lord on behalf of God, we're going to see th- themes in these passages that connect the son of David with the day of the Lord and the judgment and the kingdom. And and Isaiah is prophesying about this figure that's coming, um, not as some sort of hero from outside of the story of Israel, but as a figure within the story of Israel, operating within as a participant in the story. So let's talk about a few of these passages. I think the first one we could talk about is a a common one, Isaiah 9. Yeah, so Isaiah 9, uh, verse 6 and 7, for... To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts We'll do this. And this is a this is kind of a good example of kind of how apocalypticism develops. So there's a there's a case, and and this is kind of the the anti missionary Jewish response to seeing messianism here. There's a case textually for looking at this as being about Hezekiah and not about the. Um, Jesus of Nazareth. <clears throat> and yet, over time, it just, the, the, the underwhelming result of Hezekiah's life and, and, and his kingdom led, led to kind of a projection forward of these things, right? Because the, um, the unending prosperity of his government and the unending peace of his government um, on the throne of David and over his kingdom, he will establish it, uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forever. So the, like that's, you know, it's, I'm sure it was exciting for a few years under Hezekiah, <laughs> but, but this obviously falls short. And so these things get projected forward to a, some other son of yeah. David. That actually had to do these things, and to, for this thing to be, uh, for what the Lord said to be fully seen here, right? And this is presumed in you know the gospel narrative at the beginning of Luke, where this basically gets quoted uh, by the angel to Mary that right, the Lord yeah. will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there'll be no end. And so you get a pretty direct, and the assumption, of course, is that uh, there's going to be a final uh, climactic son of David that's coming in, uh, in light of the resurrection, the day of God, etc. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got another passage just a couple of chapters later that seems to highlight a very similar thing. This is Isaiah 11. And again, connecting the idea of the son of David or someone coming from David's line, but uh, even verse 
a one of Isaiah 11. I won't read this whole thing here, but I think we know this passage. There's going to come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots is going to bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord is going to rest upon him, spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He's going to delight in the fear of the Lord. He's going to judge the poor with righteousness and decide with equity for the meek of the earth uh, or the land. He's going to strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips. He's going to slay or kill the wicked. But then righteousness is going to be the belt of his waist, faithfulness, the belt of his loins. And as a result, when this shoot comes forth from the the stump of Jesse, uh, the wolf is going to dwell with the lamb, the leopard is going to lie down with the young goat, etc., etc. And it says, they're not going to hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so you get, again, this figure who's coming, who is a participant within the story of Israel. He's going to come forth from the stump of Jesse. It's not like he's separate or disconnected. He's a participant within the story who is going to decide and judge. You, you get this idea of uh, of judgment, of executing righteousness and justice in the land, faithfulness, loyalty to the God of Israel. And so perhaps this could have been speaking about Hezekiah maybe uh, as well in the past. But again, as you said, Bill, with Isaiah 9, the underwhelming nature of the fulfillment of these things, right. while it didn't seem to result in global peace and prosperity and and uh, perpetual human flourishing. Yes. And so again, like Isaiah 9, this gets pushed forward to its ultimate apocalyptic end by Second Temple authors. Yeah, and a good example of this would be like Testament of Judah 24, which is has a lot of the language of the shoot of God and and the uh, the extending of the rod of righteousness to the nations and and so uh, Testament of Judah 24 says, and after this there shall arise from you a star from Jacob and peace, and a man shall arise from my posterity like the son of righteousness walking with the sons of men in gentleness and righteousness, and in him will be found no sin. And the heavens will be opened upon him to pour out the Spirit as a blessing of the Holy Father. And he will pour the Spirit of grace on you, and you shall be sons in truth, and you shall walk in his first and final decrees. This is the shoot of God Most High. This is the fountain for the life of all humanity. Then he will illumine the scepter of my kingdom, and from your root will arise the shoot, and through it will arise the rod of righteousness for the nations to judge and to save all that call on the Lord. So you have the same idea of, you know, the shoot of God coming out of the line of David and the heavens opening the spirit of God resting on him, him executing righteousness among the nations. Uh, so in kind of a universalistic fashion. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, guys. Well, I think as we move forward, I think it would be important to get into the deep end a little bit of messianism. And uh, I I think these passages, maybe other than the Testament of Judah 24, Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 11, are familiar passages to many people. But if we're just kind of waiting in the kiddie pool with these passages that people know, oh, cool, a, a figure is going to come and he's going to bring righteousness and creation is going to be restored. And we say, okay, we make the point and we say, yeah, this is occurring within the story of Israel in context of the covenant. Let's start to wade into the deep end of the pool a little bit, because this really gets developed in a series of passages in Isaiah that are often called the servant songs, okay? And I think it's important that if if we don't see the larger context of Isaiah, you can kind of get the idea that the Messiah, like you said, Bill, early on, is just the hero in the story and someone who isn't really deeply interwoven into the story as a participant along with his people, his brothers, the people of Israel, right? And so the servant songs really make clear that there's much more going on here than just a hero coming from some outside heavenly realm coming in to rescue a bunch of people and doing something awesome for them because they need a hero and they need a rescuer. And this is where we can really get into the deep end of messianism as Isaiah is presenting it here in the servant songs. Yeah, and the, the majority of the servant songs are talking about Israel and Israel's glory, which is which makes up the, you know, Isaiah 40 through 66, the majority of the text, uh, and so, as we kind of work through, it becomes difficult to separate out the person from the nation. 
And that's kind of part of it is that um, is that the person, the the individual, is one with the nation, and therefore with the covenant. And so the right. the individual servant maintains the covenant relationship with God and maintains the covenant, which comes to a climax in Isaiah fifty three. But Isaiah fifty three doesn't redefine the whole relationship between God and Israel and the head of Israel, which is the Messiah. Yeah, exactly, that's good, <clears throat> and I think. So when we're talking about the servant song, so we'll actually probably refer to it more as a servant section because the servant songs is a technical term refers to um, four or five different songs between you know Isaiah forty and Isaiah fifty three, but really it's a larger section that deals with this servant character. And uh, first, first thing to to really tackle um, is as the servant is introduced it's not it's not ambiguous who the servant is right like uh, and, and it's and you might be surprised if you've never really studied the passage but listen to a few of these passages here so I'll, I'll read the first one Isaiah 41 Isaiah 41 verses 8 through 10. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I have took, who I took from the ends of the earth and called from the farthest corner, saying to you, you're my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. So here, clearly the servant here, the Lord's servant, is Israel. It's Jacob, the offspring of, of Abraham, kind of a collective singular for, for, Ab- for Abraham's descendants. Yeah. Same thing in Isaiah 44, verses 1 and 2, and also verse 21, exact same idea. Uh, verse 1, but now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb, and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant. Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Jeshurun, just poetic name for Israel. Verse 21, remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you, you are my servant, O Israel, and will not be forgotten by me. Right? So you get this reiterated over and over and over again, not only in 41, now again here in 44, the servant is Jacob, the servant is Israel. Yeah, and then in chapter 48, you get again, uh, 48 verse 20, go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea, declare this with a shout of joy, proclaim it, send it out to the end of the earth, say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. And then 49, 3, he said to me, you are my, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. And so some people feel a little threatened by these passages (laughs) (laughs) that somehow, that somehow it's, you know, taking away from uh, Jesus in some way. And that's just not the case. The problem is, is that if you don't have a Jewish apocalyptic narrative to interpret and read these things within, uh, then you separate Jesus from the Jewish narrative. And then when you introduce the Jewish narrative, somehow Jesus is in opposition to it. Uh, right. Whereas right. if you read if you read these within a Jewish, within the covenant and apocalyptic narrative, then it's not threatening that Israel is the servant. Right. Because the head of Israel then fits within that narrative. Right. Yeah, and it's it's like we brought up before, it becomes like a zero-sum game. So every passage mm-hmm. is like this, all throughout the New Testament. Either Jesus gets a point, or Israel gets a point. You can't have both. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of those apparent contradictions throughout the Scriptures... Um, Really, a lot of them have their origin in a similar, or, or have the, the the origin of the confusing, the part of the conversation it starts with a similar conversation. It starts with a similar kind of issue of confusion. It's so, and it's really reiterated by the language of servant or slave in Isaiah. So, the idea of chosenness, election, covenant, servant, who represents those things. Again, we've said this all the way back in season one, and we've said it in so many episodes trying to reiterate it, that uh, 
None of these things imply some sort of special status so that they're the only ones who inherit blessings from God. Like that's none of this is implied. So the, so the idea of a servant or a slave, that, that word there, um, Eved is in Hebrew, it implies a role to keep, not a special status, not just a privileged individual, but they have a role to keep. The, the assumed backdrop of the entire servant narratives is like the rest of the covenant. Yeah. The assumed backdrop is that Israel has a role to keep, and yet Israel must be holy in order to fulfill the role for which they've been called. And that brings up all of the larger conversation about the kind of crisis of covenant maintenance that they find themselves in. And so uh, if you go back to the very start of this section, it talks about, uh, it says, uh, comfort, comfort my people. Say to Jerusalem, you've received double for your sins. And so it's basically an apocalyptic proclamation at the end of this extended period of judgment. And it says, the, the time of your desolation is ended forever. The Lord is going to come with his arm and he's going to redeem Zion and she's going to be the joy of the whole earth. But it starts with acknowledging that they had to receive discipline, covenant discipline, because of their refusal to live in a way, not just, well, you're my special children, so you have to be an example. They're not the pastor's kid. That's not what we're saying. (laughs) The point is, is that how can they be a light to the nations if they actually don't walk in the light. Right. It's in light of their role and their calling of a, of a job description, not of a privileged status. So like you have also in Isaiah um, uh, 42, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of different things that are, that are fascinating here. So Isaiah 42, 1. Uh, and also, just a little bit later in 6 through 8, says that, they, that the servant is the one who will bring justice to the nations, light to the nations. And, they're, and, and this is an interesting statement here. They're going to rescue those who are imprisoned and open the eyes of the blind. And then if you jump ahead to verses 19 and 20, you find out that their condition, their lack of holiness, has actually made them blind. Like, who is blind but my servant? So they're blind, and now they're blind, and they're dumb, unable to see, and now unable to warn, right? Unable to to be a light to the nations because of their condition, which is obviously, this is all in the same chapter, so it's meant to be ironic that these guys who are meant to be a light to the nations and to open blind eyes and rescue those who are imprisoned, they are themselves blind and dumb, totally incapable of walking in their calling. Yeah, Bill, I mean, that's so huge because you see even just a few verses later in Isaiah 42, 24, and 25, who gave up Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunderers? Who was the one who gave up his servant to right. these nations uh, in in covenantal discipline? Like you have to see this as God maintaining his covenant in right. covenantal discipline with his servant, the servant that has been called to be a light to the nations. And verse 24 of Isaiah 42 says, was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned in whose ways they would not walk and whose law they would not obey? So he poured on him the heat of his anger. He poured on his servant the heat of his anger and the might of battle and set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. I mean, this is clearly God maintaining his covenant with his servant, the people of Israel, whom he has chosen to be the light to the rest of the nations. I like, I like in that passage too, and we've brought this up before, but it's not, the covenant isn't, the, the, the covenant doesn't have to be maintained because of 
because they were too self-righteous and they thought they needed to obey God. It's, it's that actually they didn't keep, they would not keep the Torah. You know, like, like going right. back to Deuteronomy episode, that real pivotal passage where he says, it's not up in heaven, it's not, you know, in the depths of the sea, so that it's too hard for you to do it. You can do it. You can obey my instruction. The problem is, is that you don't want to. And so this becomes like the source of all the discipline. And then you, you move ahead into Isaiah 59, or I'm sorry, Isaiah 49. And this kind of comes together, like John just read above, where he says at the start of Isaiah 49, he said to me, you're my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. So he clarifies in the passage, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. And then he continues in verse 5, And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And so what you have is there's been this section uh, starting whether Isaiah 40 or Isaiah 42 where it's describing the condition of Israel and presumably describing some sort of remnant, either group or remnant individual within Israel that is actually being called by God to, the way it says here, raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel, bring back or restore or bring back to to repentance. And I will make you a light for the nations as well, so that my salvation might reach the end of the earth. The light of the nations is already a passage that's been used in Isaiah 42 of the larger calling of the nation. And so now we start to see this little bit of a shift where there's some sort of a, like scholars call it, an Israel within Israel, whether it's a collective, whether it's a group. Or it's, a, or it's an individual, there's a servant amongst the servant that is going to Israel to actually call them back to the Lord. And that's when the proclamation is, it's not enough for you to only walk in that calling to your own people, but you will, I will also make you a light to the nations here. So we see... You know, like, like we're just saying, the point of the servant is that he has a role to keep. And then here we start to see this little bit of a shift where their role to keep actually now looks like someone else is going to them in light of their failure to keep their role. And someone's actually going to redeem them so that God's plan might be accomplished and they might end up keeping their role. Yeah. Yeah, so this brings us to the issue of the Messiah being the head of Israel, because in both Isaiah 42 and 49, you get references to uh, the servant being a light for the nations, and both of those passages get quoted in the New Testament in relation to Jesus specifically. And so, then the question becomes, what's the relationship between the singular and the collective? And a lot of times you get, you know, theologians that will argue for a collective singular, the problem that happens usually in those discussions is that the idea of a collective singular is used as the means to re-narrate and to move away from a Jewish and or apocalyptic narrative to some other kind of narrative. When in reality, the idea of a collective singular is true, that the the, uh, Messiah is the head over the collective whole of Israel and the covenant between God and the the seed of Abraham, but he functions within that narrative and for that narrative to maintain it, to maintain the covenant. And so, a lot of times you get a lot of confusion around it. But for example, in Second Temple literature, Psalms of Solomon 17, you get a uh, 
a description of the Messiah says in verse 21, See, Lord, and raise up for them their king, the son of David, to rule over your servant Israel in the time known to you, O God. Undergird him with the strength to destroy the unrighteous rulers, to purge Jerusalem from Gentiles who trample her to destruction, to shatter all their substance with an iron rod, to destroy the unlawful nations with the word of his mouth. And so the Messiah functions as the one ruling over the servant Israel, and he is part of the servant Israel. Israel, but then he becomes the singularized servant within the servant Israel. But there's no contradiction if it's within the same Jewish apocalyptic narrative, they fit together. Or, for example, 2 Baruch 70, uh, the end of the cloud apocalypse, it says, And all will be delivered into the hands of my servant, the anointed one, for the whole earth will devour its inhabitants. And it will happen that after that, chapter 73, that after that he has brought down everything which is in the world, and he has sat down in eternal peace on the throne of the kingdom, then joy will be revealed and rest will appear. So, the servant, the anointed one, is in context to the kingdom, that is Israel, and he's the head over that reality, and the two function together. So, you can take passages that are talking about Israel, and when they get projected into the apocalyptic narrative, the 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 anointed one the mashiach is the one who represents the maintenance of that covenant and the bringing of that covenant to its completion right yeah i think it's so important to see that because like we talked about in our episode with our kendall solon and uh, supersessionism, the covenant often gets backgrounded as opposed to being maintained in the foreground. And so to see this idea of kingship or messianism or the servant in context to the covenant, in context to what God has promised that he has not revoked or redefined or reimagined because Israel has somehow turned aside, God is maintaining his covenant with them and raising up a singular servant within the broader servant of his people Israel to raise them up, to bring them back in repentance, to bring about what he had promised in the covenant at Sinai and with Abraham. So, so important to see that because, again, we, we've kind of gone in modern New Testament studies and, and a, a lot of modern scholars will look at the servant and then look at Jesus and go, oh, well, you know, we, we can go back to those passages and just find, like the we've talked about before, playing the Where's Waldo game and going, oh, where's Jesus? Oh, there he is right there. He's going to He's going to bring his people back to him, and he's going to restore creation. But it's again, that's often seen outside of the context of the covenant rather than within it. And I think what we're really wanting to highlight here is that this is maintained within the covenant as opposed to being outside of it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and what you have, you know, like John, like you guys both brought up, John, Josh, is, is that there there's there's a handful of different ways to think about you know cuz we're about to jump into Isaiah 53 which is where everybody gets the idea of the of the singular servant and right. but the point is is that is what the agenda behind the study is when when the agenda behind the study like when your end game is upending the covenant narrative then then what the singular servant does is he backgrounds the covenant. And if you read it and, and the, the, the covenant maintenance is foreground, then Isaiah 53 is incredibly powerful. And it reiterates the calling of Israel. And it reiterates God's unrelenting call and covenant with the nation of Israel. But the point is, is that there, there are a lot of tools that people use to kind of background the covenant until, like we said, it reaches like this zero-sum game. But the reality is you can't, especially in the theology of Isaiah, you cannot conceive of a Messiah in Isaiah that is separate from the life of Israel. The reason why we're having this talk about the confusion of who the servant is is because they're hard to distinguish. Yeah, You can't separate them. Yeah, and And this is the exact opposite of kind of how it's normally presented, right? They're they're juxtaposed against one another sometimes. They're they're but that's not that's not how it is. It's the reason 
that they're so intertwined in these passages and we're kind of trying to pull at straws to to find a way to 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 get into the conversation is because it's such an inter- the Messiah is such an integral component of the calling of Israel and Isaiah can't envision it any differently. Right. So then when you approach Isaiah 53 and the servant that is uh, is highly individualized in Isaiah 53 but if you approach the individual servant in context to the collective servant, then Isaiah 53 fits coming after Isaiah 52, yeah. and behold, your God is coming and the glorification of Jerusalem, and then leads right back into Isaiah 54, which is, you know, all the language from Revelation 21 and the glorified city. And so, Isaiah 53 is you know, God anointing his servant to maintain the covenant, to bring Israel back to repentance, to make atonement, to make righteous, so that Isaiah 54 can happen. That's it. Rather than to re-narrate Isaiah 54 or re-narrate Isaiah 52. So, speaking in a, you know, broad terms, it, like you said, it, it matters what the narrative or kind of the story uh, the overall storyline is when you approach the servant songs. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, this is seen in the New Testament, I think, on the road to Emmaus when, uh, you know, they're walking along and Jesus appears among them, asks what they're talking about, and they say, well, Jesus of Nazareth, we had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. And then he goes on, foolish heart, slow to believe, all the prophets have prophesied, um, did not the Messiah have to suffer before entering his glory? And so, the the discussion revolves around the redemption of Israel, and Jesus says, did not the Messiah have to suffer before entering his glory? The glory, of course, within a Jewish apocalyptic narrative relates to the glory of Israel, and, you know, the... the, the um, the overall theme of the servant songs in the last part of, of Isaiah is the glory of Israel. And so, what Jesus is presuming is that the Messiah is within the broad narrative of the redemption of Israel and the glorification of Israel. And there's also this necessary component within that you know, um, a narrative for the the maintenance of the covenant is the suffering of the Messiah, that God ordained that to happen within that narrative. And so, there's nothing in that discussion in Luke 24 that would suggest that there's any kind of re-narration going on or a changing of the subject. Uh, rather, the the discussion about Isaiah 53 fits within their narrative, not in contrast to it. Right, which is why the rhetorical question, did not the Messiah had to suffer yeah. and then enter his glory? This is a this is a pretty profound question, and it's not related to, you know, simply was there any other way for sins to be forgiven? It because they, they're talking about the hope of Israel. Yeah. He's like, you hope you have hope in the redemption of Israel and you don't understand that the Messiah had to suffer before entering his glory, like the nation suffers before entering their glory? Yeah. What 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 book are you guys reading? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this... yeah. And so we miss the conversation, but it's definitely assumed in that conversation. Yeah. Well, and we see this even right at the end of Isaiah 52, right? And you you made this point already, Bill, in Isaiah 52, 7, the one bringing good news to Zion and saying, your God reigns. God's going to do what he said and fulfill the covenant. Things are going to be awesome. God's going to restore Jerusalem. But then Isaiah 52, leading into 53, this is 52, 13, you get, my servant, behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and beyond the form of the, beyond that of the children of mankind. And so he shall sprinkle many nations and kings shall shut their mouths because of him. But so it's moving into the collective, of course, but the linking of 
the story of Israel with the story of the Messiah, so clearly seen right here in verse 14, as many as were astonished at you, so his appearance was so marred. And so you get this, as many as were astonished at Israel, so the Messiah's appearance was so marred. So even just in the verse before this, in verse 13, you get in Targum Jonathan of Isaiah 52, 13, it says, behold, my servant, the Messiah shall act wisely. And so, you know, come to the the, the time right. of Targums, you get... Again, this focusing on the singular figure, but it's still maintained and within the context of Israel's suffering yeah. in light of Jacob's trouble, in light of the maintenance of the covenant before they enter into a glory of their restoration, right? And, and it's like we talked about all the way back in Isaiah 2 the humbling of the pride of man and the bringing low of the pride of man so that the Lord alone can be exalted. And what's been the problem throughout Israel's history? Well, they've exalted themselves. They've said, we're awesome. We we don't want to go after God. We want to do our own thing. And God says, no, I will have a holy people, right? And so as you're saying, Bill, even earlier on in our episode, bringing this all back to the idea that there is a collective singular within the context of the nation, within the context of the covenant that calls the full nation, the whole nation, back to him in light of their covenantal calling to be a servant and a light to the rest of the nations. Yeah, and this and this really is the deep end of messianism. Yeah. Uh, the deep end of messianism is where the Messiah not only becomes a lot less personalized and individualized, and, you know, he's this figure that God sent from heaven so I wouldn't feel ashamed of myself when I have bad thoughts. <laughs> and so I'm this is bad caricature, I get it. But but only slightly. <laughs> totally. But um but but essentially what's being framed leading up like what Josh just read leading up to Isaiah 53 as many as were astonished at you so his appearance was so marred. And then, so John already talked about Israel's glory and the Messiah's glory. And what, what then the lead up here is talking about, when he, like in, in, in Luke 24, didn't the Messiah have to suffer before entering his glory? The, the point is, is that wh- why would the Messiah, the leader of the people of Israel, whose whose glory will be prefigured by Gog and Magog, the time of Jacob's trouble, these types of scenarios, why would their Messiah not suffer before entering his glory? And, and you get this in, in Hebrews 2 in the New Testament, and, and this is, I understand if this is a new reading, but um, just just try to go back and read this if this is new to you, but... Uh, Starting in verse 16, for it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. It's talking about the Messiah here. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in RSV in every (laughs) respect so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. So he had to become like them in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. So the, fr- the whole framework of the conversation is the help that he's offering to the descendants of Abraham, an atonement for their sin, and then he himself was tested by what he suffered, and so now he's able to help those who are likewise being tested. So he had to be conformed to the death, subjected to the to the cruel treatment of the of the nations, sub, subjected to the even the the judgment and discipline of God, so that then he could turn and become a faithful high priest offering help for the time of trouble to the servant yeah. so that they might cling to him and be rescued out of these trials and, and walk actually in the calling of the servant. Yeah, It really yeah. is the deep end of messianism, but you can't understand the conversation about the Messiah unless you understand these things. 
Right, and that's the presumption of whenever Jesus quotes Isaiah 53, that the Son of Man must suffer many things at, at the hands of, right. of right. the wicked and, and then be raised. And so, a lot of that revolves around Isaiah 53 and the assumption that the suffering of the Messiah is within context to the covenant – with Israel and the and the right. maintaining and the making righteous of many within Israel. And so the end of Isaiah 53 where it says yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and put him to grief grief to uh, his soul makes an offering for guilt uh, out of the anguish of his soul he will see and be satisfied by his knowledge shall the righteous one my servant Make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And the transgressors there are within Israel, and that's why it leads straight into Isaiah 54, sing, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You've been in labor for the children of the desolate one will be more than children who's married. And so the point of the suffering servant is to bring back the wayward within Israel to make righteous in light of the coming restoration. Right. And and again, so like generally, generally, I mean, there's there are many notable exceptions, but generally in Jewish history, Isaiah 53 is interpreted as, uh, according to like uh, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, 3, that the servant is Israel. And so it's the servant that's suffering. And it's not entirely out of bounds to see it that way. But in light of Isaiah 49, you also see that the role of redemption from within the servant comes from within, like there's some sort of servant within the servant that actually is drawing the nation back. And so while it's not out of bounds to look at Isaiah 53 as possibly something future related to the nation of Israel. Right. But yet it's illogical to have... Easy. Easy, Mr. Katz. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Mr. Katz. If you're not... Catching the reference, Art Katz, this is one of his major burdens and, and uh, yeah, has huge, uh, some really profound sermons on this, this very yeah. topic. But It's true, yeah. super impactful. But, yeah. but it's not out of bounds to read Isaiah 53 in that light. But again, just like we say in a Christian context, if you read Isaiah 53 and you don't have Isaiah 40 through 52 in mind, and the covenant narrative and the and the covenant maintenance narrative, then you just he's just some cosmic hero. Yeah. But likewise, if if you're if you look at it in a Jewish narrative and you don't recognize the nature of covenant maintenance and that God has ordained a Isaiah forty nine, a servant within the servant to actually redeem the servants so that they might be a light to the nations, then you also miss the conversation of Isaiah 53. Yeah. Yeah. Well, taking this to the New Testament just briefly, you know, you get something even at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, right? Matthew 1 and Matthew 2. And these passages are, that we'll reference here just briefly are often just either taken as like, oh, cool, like, where's Waldo? Where's Jesus from the Old Testament? Like a passage like Isaiah 7, and behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and we'll call his name Emmanuel. Or, you know, Matthew's quote of Hosea 11 in Matthew 2, 15, out of Egypt I called my son. And we look at those passages when we read those, and and if we just assume that the Messiah is just this divine rescuer from heaven that just kind of comes from outside the story rather than a servant within the servant and in context of the covenant, we miss the point of what Matthew's trying to get at. Right. Because Matthew yeah. understands this dynamic and is is showing that Jesus's life and death and resurrection is exemplary. It's an example. In other words, he's demonstrating that Jesus is walking the path that Israel has walked, 
and Jesus is walking the path that Israel will walk, this idea of death unto resurrection. And so when you get a passage like, out of Egypt I called my son, Matthew 2.15, you know, the quote that said there, quoting Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, you can go back to Hosea 11.1 1 and read that, and it has nothing to do with a messianic prophecy of someone coming and dying for sin and and anything like that. It's it, just a historical point that's being made about how God took Israel out of Egypt. God's called Israel's son, right. Exodus 4, and it has nothing to do with anyone dying for sins or coming and, and doing any of that. Right. But <laughs> Matthew is identifying Jesus as being this servant within the servant, this idea of his life and death and resurrection being exemplary for the larger servant, for the larger nation, right? And so he says, out of Egypt, I called my son. This was to fulfill what was spoken of by the prophet, that the pattern of Jesus's life demonstrates the pattern of Israel's life. So it's the servant within the servant. And when you understand this, same thing with like the virgin shall conceive and bear forth a, a son, right? This is a, a story from Israel's history in Isaiah and Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 8. And it's not even just primarily a messianic prophecy about God coming and saving people from sin. It has to do with the nation and the nation being saved from their enemies and the king of Syria and a child was going to be born in context to that to say, hey, God's going to save you from your enemies before this child is going to be able to, to eat solid food. And sure enough, you read in Isaiah 8, this is exactly what comes to pass. A son is born and the people of Israel are saved from their enemies. And so what's the pattern that Matthew is demonstrating? He's demonstrating the pattern of Israel's past and Israel's future, right? Did not the Messiah have to suffer before entering into his glory? Just as does not Israel have to have their the power of the holy people being shattered and crushed, Deuteronomy 32 in the Song of Moses. Does, does this not have to happen? Will not they have to be brought to nothing and brought to full dependence upon God? Isaiah 2, the pride of man will be brought low and the Lord alone will be exalted so that then he can exalt his servant and call them to be a light to the rest of the nations as he promised in his covenant. Yeah, so I, you know, another way I think you could say what you're saying there, Josh, is that the servant singular is a servant to the servant collective. Yes, and <laughs> yeah. to uphold and maintain the the covenant and the story, the the narrative. Whereas a lot of times you'll get those passages quoted, and people will say, "See, Jesus fulfilled the fulfilled all the hopes of Israel and and the story of Israel." Right. And by right. doing that, what they're doing is changing the narrative and changing the story. And so, exactly. the servant collective then becomes the servant of the servant singular to change the narrative. And what comes to mind is like, you know, Romans 15, where it says, where Paul says, For I tell you that the Messiah became a servant to the circumcised, to the Jews, yeah. right. to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. Yes. Yes. And as a sub-narrative, a sub-point, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. But the whole point is, is that Jesus, as the Messiah, was a servant to uh, ser uh, the singular servant to the collective servant, and that that's, that's the it. order of of uh, of approaching it. Yeah, really good. that's really good. And uh, let's just wrap up with um, uh, looking at the last real significant messianic passage. Well, that's not true. That's true because you have like Isaiah sixty three and stuff like that that we won't get into. But Isaiah 61, uh, you know, is significant, you know, cited by Jesus, Luke 4. He reads this in the temple or in the synagogue one, one day. And, but um, <clears throat> also, again, we just want to encourage you to fit this within the larger narrative as well. So we have the servant of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of fainting, uh, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. 
So what we have here is, uh, so again, largely kind of quoted in, in, in contexts that are very universal and not particularly related to the covenant narrative. But it's just the opposite here. Like all these descriptors, the, the, the poor, the brokenhearted, the captive, those who are bound in prison, those who are mourning, those who are mourning in Zion specifically, all of these are descriptors of the people of Israel leading up till now, be in light of the covenant dynamic. And so these are these are descriptors of this group that God has been talking about and talking to the entire time. And the point is, is that there is going to be a deliverer for the servant. So like, again, like Romans 15, that was a great citation, Romans 15, that what we saw is that the Lord came and became a servant to the circumcision in light of their calling is how the is how the rest of that sentence goes in light of what God has called them to do in light of their everlasting calling and the gift and callings are irrevocable he had just said before that so in light of that the messiah came as a servant to them and that's really what Isaiah 61 is about it's a reiteration of the of the calling of Israel and of God's commitment to not allow them to drift endlessly from their calling as a whole. Not as a, not, of course, there have been righteous Jews throughout all of history, righteous Israelites. But as a whole, God's not willing to let the nation drift endlessly. And this is how the, the prophecies about the Messiah looking forward in Isaiah, and also now looking back at the Messiah, how we should think of his role both in the first century and his role moving forward in history as a servant amidst the servant. Yeah. Right. So then when Jesus quotes Isaiah 61 and Luke 4 and says, you know, today this has been fulfilled in, his, in your hearing, nobody's hearing him say that... I am now spiritually fulfill, fulfilling and realizing all of Israel's hope, and it's going to be a spiritualistic, universalistic thing. <laughs> Everybody is simply hearing him say, I'm the Messiah. Right. right. I'm, I'm right. the servant, right? And I'm the one who's going to glorify Jerusalem, Isaiah 62. I'm the one that's going to tread down the nations as a wine press, Isaiah 63. The the issue is, is that he's coming in to bring Israel back to God and as a revivalist, and then he tells them that throughout Israel's history that Gentiles are more righteous than Israel, that they need to return to their God, and that's what gets him driven out and almost killed in Luke 4, not because he's changing the narrative, but because he's calling them wicked and that that they're the ones that need to be bro- be brought back. Yeah, well, and they're looking at Jesus, his own townspeople, the ones that grew up with him and saw him as a little little kid growing up in Nazareth, and they're like, we know this guy, and now he's saying he's the Messiah, he's the one who's going to bring Israel back to him, like he's the one that God has anointed. We know him, he's just a little young boy walking around in the streets with his brothers and sisters, and wait, now he's saying that, he's the guy. And if we don't actually acknowledge that he's the guy, then things won't go well for us. Uh, That's what he's saying. And uh, hence why they want to throw him off into the Valley of Armageddon. (laughs) Mm. Well, guys, I know this has been a bit of a longer episode and we did wade into the deep end of messianism a little bit here. I I think... uh, you know, maybe we'd all agree that this really shouldn't necessarily be the deep end of messianism. It probably should be messianism 101, right? (laughs) Hopefully, listeners, this has been encouraging uh, and provoking, and definitely uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts and your comments and your questions. For sure, send that in to us uh, on uh, the contact form on our website. But next week, we want to continue to develop uh, the prophets in the Tanakh. We want to begin to speak about Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So join us next time. And until then, thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. 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 Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at 
ApocalypticGospel.com and follow us on Twitter at ApocalypticGospel. Gospel.